Good morning. I'm Roseanne Marucci, and along with Monica Anthony, we are this Sunday's Elders of the Day at Long Presbyterian Church. Welcome to this morning's worship service video. We hope you are remaining safe and healthy and exercising caution as Maryland and the counties in which we live continue to monitor the ebb and flow of the pandemic. Each week we remember a friend at home and a college student. This week's friend at home is Sandy Tackett and our college student of the week is Cadet Jake Carson. I know they would appreciate a call, a letter, an email to let them know you're thinking of them. Whether this is the first time you are joining us or you connect every Sunday, may something in this worship service, the music, the children's message, uh, the scripture, prayer, may they give you comfort and peace and remind you how profoundly God loves you. Now let us worship God and be mindful of the many ways we can see and feel their presence in our lives. Good morning. I'm Mike Meister. I'm the treasurer here at LPC, and I come to you today to talk about our stewardship campaign for 2021. Uh, as you know, the theme for this year is in uncertain times, we can be certain of God's call. And, the, you know, I think we all agree that this has been a very unusual year. We stopped having our regular church gatherings together back in March, and I think we all expected that this was going to be resolved before now we'd be back to normal or some semblance of normal way before October. Um, it's been a significant public health emergency and uh, we certainly miss celebrating getting to see our friends and our family, your church family here at LPC. Um, but we have had some activities that have continued to go on uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about those and, and how that affects our budget. So uh, you meant, many of you probably know that one of the major portions of our budget is related to personnel costs. And uh, we are very grateful that this year uh, our, our personnel staff has, has been able to continue to do their work on our behalf in new and creative and exciting ways. Amy has managed to uh, keep us together by providing a weekly uh, worship service and a sermon uh, that she has recorded and sent out each week with uh, with Christy's help and uh, Christy continues to be uh, supporting the communication through the e-news and keeping us all up to date with the church's activities. Natalie continues to direct a choir and provide magnificent music to support each of our worship services. So um, some of you may not know that the church has agreed to continue to reimburse our um, nursery nursery staff uh, who are not able to work when the church is not open. Um, we felt that was the right thing to do. Um, there's no fault of theirs that uh, uh, we are not able to meet at this time. Another big part of our budget is a property. Uh, a church of our size needs to be maintained and cared for and the, those activities have commit, uh, continued. Our property committee has uh, inspected the church and kept things operational during the time and made necessary changes. They've um, installed uh, hands-free faucets in, in each of the bathrooms. They've added uh, dispensers for hand sanitizers and other places throughout the church to keep everybody safe. And uh, they've been preparing for a return at any time when, once we get the word that it's going to be safe to return. So, um, you know, a church of our size has uh, unexpected issues sometimes. This year, this summer, we've had uh, some problems with some of the sprinkler heads in the, the main sanctuary. And uh, our property committee has supported that and, and resolved those issues. Um, but, you know, there are unexpected things that happen. Uh, from a financial standpoint, uh, the church has continued to, to operate as we normally operate. Bob Patterson, our bookkeeper, has done a great job. It's kind of quietly beside, behind the scenes. Uh, continues to write the checks and pay our bills on time. Jan Loftus, you know from the E News, is working at a new satellite office on Wiz Avenue in Laurel. And uh, as they've been accepting pledges and contributions to the church and making deposits on our behalf. 
and Randy Kleck has been authorizing um, the expenditures from the church from the checking account uh, consistent with our procedures and uh, we're very grateful for all their efforts to keep the church functioning during this time period. Um, we have not had to spend all the money some of the church uh, expected expenses have not occurred this year and um, uh, our finance committee has recommended to session and session has agreed that some of our unspent funds could be spent um, allocated in this time of extreme need throughout our community by making additional contributions to Lars uh, to help folks who are uh, struggling in this difficult time so that is one one thing that uh, has happened you may not know about. We have had volunteers who continue to run food drives and support Lars. We've had volunteers who have made masks for distribution to health care centers and uh, community uh, organizations where there was a need for that. And LPC continues to answer, answer God's call in other ways that I don't, don't even know about. But uh, I am grateful. So, as Walt mentioned last week, we're we're grateful, we're very very grateful for all all of your continued contributions to LPC. Uh, when we had a finance committee earlier this year, we were uncertain what the numbers were going to be, and you sort of uh, we were very impressed by your commitment to LPC and God's work through LPC, and your continued making contributions. Uh, throughout the year. We're looking forward to your support in 2021 as well. As Walt mentioned, we are not seeking to increase the church's budget, um, but we hope you will continue to support us and prayerfully consider making uh, a pledge for next year on or before November the 8th. So we all cannot wait to get back together and see, see you again. And we're looking forward to that day. It'll be a big celebration. And um, um, until such time, please take good care of yourselves and God bless you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. talk to you today about things we care about. Here's an example right here. I didn't mean for him to join us, but here he is. This is Chewy, and I care about Chewy. And I was wondering, what kinds of things do you care about? What matters to you? Do you have any ideas? The reason I'm asking is because when we care about things, we take care of them. 
which means I take care of Chewy. I take him to the vet. I make sure that he gets all the walks and runs in the woods that he loves. I make sure he gets lots and lots of pets. And I make sure that he gets fed. I don't actually feed him, Paul does that, but that's okay. I make sure that he gets fed. Because I care about Chewy, I take care of Chewy. And so today, I want you to look at these slides because these are people from the church who care about the church. And you see what they're doing? They're taking care of the church. They're taking care of the property. Josh is mowing the lawn, getting to ride on that big tractor, which is so fun. And then you see Bob Patterson is picking things up and putting them in the back of Harry Hudson's truck. And Harry Hudson, he brought his big truck so that we could load it up with things and then he could drive them over to the big brush pile, which Manny from IDL will turn into mulch. And then you can see Jim Cross and you see Jerry Pelch and you see Stacy Coker and you see Wayne and everybody is there because they care about the church. And so they are taking care of the church. So again, what kinds of things do you care about? What matters to you? What's important to you? And then how are you taking care of it? If it's somebody, if it's a relationship, like a friend or somebody in your family, how are you helping take care of them? And by taking care, I don't mean making sure that they're fed or making sure that you pet them a lot. I mean, are you letting them know how much you care? Are you showing them how much you care? Maybe you have a pet. Maybe something you care about are the flowers outside. Are you helping take care of those? Giving them water? Picking up any trash? Are there things in your room that you care about? Are you taking good care of those things? I know, sometimes I don't take such good care even though there are, say, pieces of clothing that I really love. Sometimes I'm not so good at taking care of them and I just throw them on the ground when I'm done. But then I remember this is important to me and I pick it up and I put it in the hamper so I can take care of it. And all those things we care about, first of all, what you care about in your heart, that's a gift from God. All the things we care about, gifts from God. And what is God hoping? We'll take care of all those things. Whether it's butterflies, or pets, or a friend, or the earth, or grass, or trees, or your clothes, whatever you care about, it's a gift from God. And God is saying, can you take care of this? And that is a gift too, that God trusts us so much. So I hope you have a great day. Enjoy the Sunday school lesson, and I hope to see you soon. Bye. Today's scripture reading is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Paul, Savannah, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God the Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that the Lord has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of persons we, re we, pr we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known. 
so that we had no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you. I'm finding myself drawn more and more to the Apostle Paul's letters, which would completely appall my younger self. I have compassion for that younger self who really did not like Paul, the Apostle. That younger self who would be shocked at the comfort I'm finding there today. Study after study, though, shows how we always underestimate how much we will change, how much we are changed by our experiences and our relationships and our current contexts as we age. We're never set, we're never done as much as we like to think we are. So when I was younger, in spite of having seen and experienced some people doing some really awful, horrible things, I still insisted that John Calvin's doctrine of the total depravity of human beings had to be wrong. But lately, I've been thinking that maybe he's on to something. Looking back, I realized my younger self underestimated the powerful control that fear and anxiety can have in our lives and how that could even infect entire institutions. I underestimated how people in power could succumb to their fear and their anxiety and how our very human fear and anxiety could infect every part of human life. And when I was younger, I overestimated our ability to resist the lure of these paths, these paths that pretend to save us, pretend will keep us safe. Nelson Mandela says, may your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. And over the years, over the years especially, as I've learned and paid attention to the amygdala in our brain, the amygdala that is so amazingly sensitive to threat, I've come to appreciate just how hard it is to do what Nelson Mandela suggests. Right now, we're living in a world dominated by fear, dominated by anxiety, which are natural responses to such an uncertain future. These are natural responses to a world infected by COVID-19. These are natural responses when our security and our way of life seem to be threatened. So I'm turning more and more to Paul's letters to his dear ones because they too were living in contexts of fear and anxiety. They too were subject to powerful people making decisions in an effort to combat and soothe their own individual and personal fears and anxieties. Paul wrote intimate, loving letters to remind the people who they were, who God is, and the power of the saving love of Christ in our lives. We need such reminders, especially today. So this is the first letter, this letter to the Thessalonians. This is the first letter that Paul ever wrote that we know of. And he wrote it 20 years after Jesus' resurrection. And he wrote it to people he loved dearly, a people who were suffering, a people being persecuted, a people who were trying so hard to hold on to Jesus' view of the world where the God of love reigned supreme the God of love. What world are you living in these days? A world where we long for our leaders to set everyone right. We long for our leaders to subdue the voices of people who threaten us. A world where we feel as though we are constantly under threat, that we're surrounded by enemies who are always at the ready to take us down? Or are we living in a world suffused with God's love? 
a world constantly called to the way of love, to the way of peace, to the way of grace. A world where even when you can't see it, you still trust the power of God's love. Paul intentionally opens his letter here with these words, grace to you and peace because he's challenging the Roman and Caesar's motto of peace and security. Paul's offering them a more true, a more faithful, a more eternal worldview. He knows the way they see the world affects how they understand their place in it, their role in it, what they believe about God at work in the world and in their hearts and in their lives affects how they see the world. Caesar saw himself as the son of God and that's how he saw the world. What they believe about God at work in the world and in their hearts affects the world they live in, affects the world they perceive. Is it a world of friend or foe? enemy or ally, God's good creation or self-centered human nature just waiting to take us down. Every single day we have a choice and the choice is so, so stark right now. Are you living in a world where you must be ready to protect you and yours from outside threat? Or are you living in a world where every single person is made in the image of God. And therefore, whether we like them or not, they are our brother and sister in Christ. Every day, every hour, what world are you living in? Do you recognize that you must choose, especially because everyone is shouting, so insistently and loudly and shrilly that we must be afraid. We must be very, very afraid. Presbyterian theologian Douglas Otati just wrote this 770 page book called Theology for the 21st Century. And friends of mine thought we'd get together and read it together and discuss it. Had I known it was 70, 770 pages, I might never have picked it up in the first place. But his first chapter makes theology so practical. Theology is how we understand our relationship with God, our relationship with ourselves, with each other, with all of creation. He makes it so concrete because he uses his relationship with his adolescent children. Do you believe, he asks, do you believe your children are gifts from God but don't belong to you? Do you take seriously what science has to say about human development? Specifically and paradoxically, He refers to how teens need more sleep at the exact same time that their biological sleep cycles are shifting. Or do you believe your children are responsibilities from God and it is your work to produce obedient children that you will be judged on how obedient your children are? God is judging you on how well they turn out. If we start with God's love, informed by scientific research, he says, then we see our children one way. But if we start with a demanding, judging God, then when our teens are awake late into the night and asleep late into the day, we might see them a different way, maybe as self-centered and slothful and lazy, maybe some of that depravity Calvin talks about. And we think that God expects us to change that, to change those humans, those teenagers. Who is, which is your God? Who is your God? What does your God expect of you? How does your God define faithfulness? These questions matter. 
And it especially matters today when the air we breathe is so filled with fear. Do we remember who we are? Why we are here? What God hopes for us? Even in the midst of this suffering and persecution. Now, Paul doesn't gloss over just how hard this will be, how hard this is to continue to believe in the God of love in the face of very scary and very uncertain and very threatening times. He talks about the work of faith, the labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope. On the surface, these may seem like nice throwaway words, but dig in, sit with them for a bit. This, our faith, living faithfully, is going to take work. And labor, that is the kind of toiling that wears us out. Are you worn out yet? Are you tired? Are you just done? Are you weary of trying to be faithful, you know, in this particular context, in this particular season? Are you sick and tired of the news, COVID restrictions? not seeing your family, not getting inside to have worship in the sanctuary? Are you sick and tired of looking ahead to holidays that will be unlike any other holidays we might ever have imagined? How about politics? How about the news? Had enough of that? The election? Racism? Climate change? Well, get ready. Because the third and final word Paul uses is steadfast, as in stay steadfast in hope, which means endurance. Like the saying, this apparently is a marathon, not a sprint. Remember way, way back ages and ages ago when we thought the pandemic life was a sprint? When we thought we'd be sheltering in place for two weeks, maybe four at the most. Thessalonians and Paul were hoping this would be a short time until Jesus returned and all was set right. Paul is writing to the Thessalonians just 20 years after Christ's resurrection. Here we are 2,000, 2,000 years later and we realize we can't just sit around and wait. We can't just sit around and wait for November 3rd. I seriously doubt much will be clear before we go to bed that night. Then maybe when the election is settled, or maybe when the president is inaugurated, or the vaccine is developed, or maybe when it's distributed, or when enough people get the vaccine for us to feel safe. You know, we're waiting around for when life goes back to how it was in the olden days, the olden day normal. Our stewardship theme is, in uncertain times, certain of God's call. And we talked about it this week at session. Are we, are you certain of God's call to you right now? This is what Gene Epley had to say. That we will figure out how to make do. Yeah, that, that, that was my, my point. We will figure out what we need to do to keep things going and we'll find a way to do it. Uh... Which means Gene trusts that God is at work in us and through us, helping us and guiding us as we figure out how to move through each day. This is what Jerry Pelch had to say that we're going to accomplish what needs to be done. Which means Jerry trusts that God will give us what we need, the strength, the faith, the endurance, the hope to accomplish what needs to be done right now. We have, through God's grace, what we need to continue to be the church today, here and now, and for all the tomorrows to come. And that gives us confidence to continue to trust in God's love as opposed to giving in to the world's fear. The forces of this world will continue to insist this is such a 
frightening time. We must be scared, scared of each other, scared of those who vote differently, scared of those who carry a different citizenship or are a different skin tone, that we must be scared of those who follow a different creed, for they are all out to get us, and they outnumber us. That's what we're being told right now. The problem facing us, all of us, every one of us today, is how to live a faithful life in Christ. How to live in and through the saving love God has for every person and every creature and all creation. There's nothing new or different about the question of how shall we live our call. It's the same one that Paul is addressing with the Thessalonians. But it's also true that every single context is unique. And there's never been a year exactly like this one, 2020, in the history of humanity. How do we live the saving love of Christ in this day? How do we live out of the trust we have in that, in this day, in this world, in our lives? Over and over I hear people say, we've never been here before. Exactly. It's a brand new time to experience and make decisions that come from our deepest beliefs about the God of love. And so let us be gentle with ourselves as we recognize our very human default when we're facing something new that scares us. Because in those circumstances, if we don't think about it, if we aren't intentional, then our decisions come from the deepest part of our brain. That's where the amygdala lives. That's where the knee-jerk, desperate longing to feel safe and secure at all costs lures us into trusting in idols as opposed to the deepest part of our heart where our decisions come from a place of trusting trusting in the good grace of God's saving love for all creation and the way to be faithful is to immerse ourselves in God's love immerse ourselves in the God of love that can be found in creation, that can be found in each other, in our connections with each other, that can be found in the faces of even those we might be hating a little bit right now. Fill up on God's love, not on the world's hate, so that you can share God's saving love over the long haul even when it's hard, especially when it's hard, even when it's unpopular, especially when it's unpopular. For that is God's call in these uncertain times. We are certain of God's call to us to be faithful to the living God, the God of love. Amen.
Mocha sit. Mocha sit. Did you want an apple? Who, ah, who stole the apple?